Based on the uh, last talk, Dave has asked me to sing my presentation. It's a good thing, too, because I have perfect pitch. I learned that in Little League. We're, uh, we're going to talk about calorie restriction. How many people have calorie restricted before at any point? Quite a few of you. I, I would expect most of this crowd would have tried it. Um, how many people are still doing it? One. It, did I miscount? Is, is any other? No one. Well, there's a reason for that. It's really hard. Um, I, I study it, so I did it for a month, and my wife begged me to stop. She suggested I was irritable. I know that's false. But it has some really interesting benefits, so that's one of the things we're gonna talk about, and I just lasered the picture instead of changing the slide. There we go. Um, calorie restriction is kind of the gold standard. When I was, I'm a physicist, I'm not a biologist, okay? So we're used to taking huge amounts of data and coming up with simple formulas like F equals MA or E equals MC squared that describe the universe. I'm not that smart. But in looking at aging, it was apparent that calorie restriction was the only thing that consistently worked. And it worked in, in yeast and worms and flies and fish and spiders and mice and rats and hamsters and dogs and primates. And in human studies, uh, we've seen a lot of benefits too. Um, now, there has been some uh, flack about calorie restriction just recently. There were two 20-year monkey studies. The first monkey study showed an increase in lifespan, decrease in cancer, decrease in uh, diabetes, decrease in inflammation, okay? The second study showed no increase in lifespan, but did show an increase, or a decrease in cancer, a decrease in, in diabetes, a decrease in inflammation. So what's up with the second study? Why did it not show an increase in lifespan? Well, there was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, just this last December that talks about that. And what they disclose is, in any scientific experiment, you have the test group and you have the control group. And in the second experiment, the control group was also calorie restricted. The experimental group was just more calorie restricted. Okay, So what we've learned from this, it's a valuable point, is that a little calorie restriction increases lifespan in, in primates. And if you do it even more, it might not increase lifespan any further. And that's because we have a lot of mechanisms that are already being turned on without calorie restriction. But it's still got a decrease in cancer, a decrease in inflammation, a decrease in, um, in diabetes. So worthwhile. So in human clinical trials, we've actually put people on calorie-restricted diets for six months. We look at their biomarkers. They have reduced blood pressure. They have better metabolic profiles. Uh, they lose weight, obviously. Um, and in epidemiological studies, if I could only learn to, to say that word, uh, we see a definite correlation between cardiovascular disease, which is the number one killer in America, uh, diabetes, which about 40% of the population has got a glucose issue in this country right now, uh, cancer, and overall risk of death. So this is a great thing. We should all be doing it, right? In animal model studies, we can be even more precise in our measurements because we can put the animal in cages and control them for their entire lifespan. And we see a 25 to 50% increase in lifespan. It's one of the only things we know of that increases not only average, but maximal lifespan, the oldest of the old. A 55% decrease in cancer. Decreases in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease in those type of animal models. 
complete protection against type 2 diabetes, which is at epidemic levels. Reduction in cardiovascular risk, again, the, the number one cause of death in America, and reduction in inflammatory diseases. So why aren't we doing it? Well, because it's really hard. Our systems are built to enjoy food. Food is good. I like ice cream. I want my bowl of ice cream, and I'm going to have it. So in looking at aging, while there are some Buddhist monks that can possibly do the calorie restriction uh, routine, and, and my hat's off to anyone who can do this and keep it up, because it is, it is just a, a phenomenal step towards good health. But I can't do it. So I started looking for ways to biohack it. And what we found, and, and this wasn't my work, this was actually work out of MIT and Harvard and uh, Sinclair and Durante were, were heading off back and forth. And what they found is that either increasing NAD levels or decreasing NADH seemed to be the switch in calorie restriction that led to increases in lifespan and increases in some of these, these benefits. And since that time, that was actually originally done by Lynn in 2003, uh, but since that time there have been plenty of studies, including uh, looking at you know, human cells and extending the lifespan of human cells. So pretty impressive uh, sum of literature. So the question now is, how do we increase NAD, which stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, which is why we call it NAD. How can we increase this? How can we decrease NADH? And how can we do this safely and effectively and consistently so that we can get the benefits of calorie restriction without having to avoid our bowl of ice cream? I call it the have your cake and eat it too theory. So what we found is we could take a human metabolite namely oxaloacetate, and react it through the enzyme malate dehydrogenase into malate. Now malate, you're, you may have heard of, it's, it's in apples in abundance. So if you eat an apple, you get, you get a, uh, a bunch of malate. Uh, and it, as part of that process, as part of that reaction, which is, is very, uh, the delta G is very negative, that means it's very likely to occur. It's a probability function, okay? So what we do is we take NADH as part of this reaction, and it turns into NAD, and this drives up the NAD to NADH ratio. Now you might be asking, well, why don't we just supplement with NAD? Well, because it's a huge molecule, and when you ingest it in your system, you can actually buy it as NADH, which is not what you want, you want, you want this guy over here. Um, when you ingest it into your system, it breaks down. So you, you'd have to do it intravenously, and then the question is, is even if you do it intravenously, how do you get it into your cells? Okay, so we're using really, really tiny molecules. Oxaloacetate only has four carbons. Okay, it's a really small molecule. In order to get in, go through this reaction and boost this ratio. And this was actually measured uh, by a guy named Krebs. So this information has been out there for a long time. Krebs measured this back in 1968. And he saw a 900% increase in this ratio in two minutes. So pretty powerful. So oxaloacetate, you know, you probably haven't heard of it before. And it's what makes up upgraded aging formula. It's a combination of vitamin C, which I'm sure you have heard of, and this, this strange bird, oxaloacetate. Well, oxaloacetate is in every cell of your body already. Okay? It's not a Franken molecule. This is something that is central to metabolism. This is the Krebs cycle, the thing that gives you energy in your, in your uh, mitochondria. Look at where oxaloacetate is. It's right there between malate and citrate. Okay, so now you know about 
oxaloacetate. And what we found is when we give it to animals or people or whatever, uh, it creates this high NAD to NADH ratio, which activates something else called AMP protein activated kinase, or AMPK. Now, I can see some of the eyes rolling back in your head. And just remember, naps are a good thing. I've, I've heard of that today, you know? So, so feel free to, you know, but wake up in a, in a little bit, because we've got some interesting things to say. So anyway, this AMPK thing is, is kind of like the fulcrum of a seesaw. And on one side, is NAD, and on the other side is NADH. And if the seesaw is this way, AMPK says, oh, I understand. And if it's this way, it says, oh, I understand, but it does different things. And the different things it does is it actually changes gene expression. So we can mimic calorie restriction by activating this AMPK, and we published that in the journal Aging Cell uh, in 2009. This was work out of UCLA and uh, UCSD. And AMPK activation has multiple effects. One thing, it stabilizes glucose levels, which is a good thing. Uh, it increases glucose movement to the muscles. It promotes mitochondrial biogenesis, power points of the cell. So let's see what some of the side effects of supplementing with oxaloacetate are. Well, for one thing, we see, uh, this is a lifespan graph, and here's 100% up here, 0% here. And what we see is a shift in the curve to the right. So we're seeing an increase in average lifespan at 50%, and an increase in maximal lifespan. You'll note that they all die, though. So this isn't something that's going to make you live forever. It's just something to give you a little bit of a boost with the technology that we understand today. And we see the same effect in worms and in flies and in mice. And so another effect that it has in addition to lifespan, and, and that's a pretty good effect. You know, if, if you're going to have a side effect, you might as well, you know, have that one, uh, is an increase in endurance or a reduction in fatigue. Um, so what we're going to do is, is show how that works. One, it increases the modulation of the fuel, okay? Glucose is the fuel for your system, the energy that keeps, or part of the energy stream that keeps your body going. Then the second thing it does is oxaloacetate helps the fuel burn faster, okay? It changes the rate at which the Krebs cycle spins. And then the third thing it does is it builds more fires, more furnaces to burn that fuel. So if you have more mitochondrial density, you've got more places to burn the fuel, you generate more ATP, you have more, 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 which is why we're all here, right? We all want more. So here's an example of modulating the fuel. Uh, the blue dots are fasting glucose levels, the red dots are after breakfast, the black dots are before uh, going to bed, and you can see at the start of the study, this is a 75-day study, this woman's glucose levels are all over the place, okay? At the end of the study, look at how tight her levels are. She had a 55% decrease in the amplitude of the swing of glucose throughout the day. We're modulating the glucose level. Here's another example. This was actually a clinical trial in 1968 in Japan in an obscure journal. They had an average 25% decrease or 24% decrease in fasting glucose level in diabetics. It's like, this is incredible. So I looked for the follow-on literature and there wasn't it. What? So I went to Japan. And I found this university, which happened to be up near Fukushima, of all, of all places, and uh, talked to the department. I, I waved the paper at them, and I said, are you, you know, where's the rest of this study? You know, this was done in 1968. They said, oh, there was no follow-up. I said, you had a 24% reduction in fasting glucose in diabetics 
and there was no follow-up? What? They said, well, it, it was a natural compound. I said, yeah, and it's a human compound. It's a compound we have in every cell of our body. And they said, yes, no patent. <laughs> and that ended the, the discussion. Okay? So it's important to know in non-diabetic people, we also have the fuel modulation. This is a person with fasting glucose levels. After taking the uh, oxaloacetate for 30 days, you can see how tight, again, the levels are. Slight reduction in fasting glucose levels to the low side of normal. And when we look at muscle endurance, we actually measured the uh, muscles with transducers and electrified them and then followed their decay curve into fatigue. And when we added oxaloacetate to those muscles, we saw a 10% immediate increase in endurance. 10%. Now you may say, oh, you know, 10%'s not much. Think about athletic competition, where you're trying to get a 1% increase. Okay. So I, I won't go through the biochemistry of, of why this happens. It turns out it spins the citric acid cycle faster. Uh, but one of the other things it does is by increasing AMPK, uh, we activate the pathway to build more mitochondria. And so by increasing mitochondrial density, we have more fires to burn the fuel. So again, we see incredible increases in endurance. Here's uh, Renee Milton, she's a, a world medal triathlete, and uh, she felt that the oxaloacetate helped her uh, improve her time by to when she was 25 years old. Same with cycling. Uh, the second thing I wanna talk about is brain fog, and I'm gonna run through this really quickly. We wanna protect our brain from outside assaults, from inside assaults, and then reduce plaque formation. And some of the things I'll let you read through here real quickly, protects uh, mitochondrial DNA, uh, protects from ischemia. This is all recent work. And uh, there's a company out of Israel that's actually trying to bring this through the FDA for stroke and uh, brain injury. Uh, oxaloacetate protects against mercury, aluminum, cyanide. Uh, internal assaults, it attacks uh, against T-bars production. Uh, it's a potent antioxidant. It helps uh, protect against hydrogen peroxide. And lastly, uh, it looks at reducing amyloid uh, secretions in your brain that build up and, and kind of fog that brain. So uh, this is recent work that was done out of the, uh, as a result of a two-year grant from the Alzheimer's Association. And what we saw is an increase in protective chemicals, like the secreted APP-alpha uh, with the oxaloacetate, a decrease in amyloid plaques, uh, here again as compared to the control group, decreases in the second type of plaque, decreases in hippocampal plaque density, uh, this EOD is every other day feeding, so it's a comparison for calorie restriction. Uh, increase in short-term memory by 50%. And uh, I think I'll, I'll end it there. <laughs>